Welcome to this evening's webinar on Mercatory Conversations on Irish Traveller Language. Uh, thank you very much. We've had uh, over 80 people signing up for this evening's session, so we're delighted to have you here and very much looking forward to the discussion. Uh, this session forms part of a series developed by CALM, the Center for Applied Linguistics and Multilingualism at NUI Galway, and that is in fact a part of the Moore Institute. My name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute, and uh, it's been great to be associated with this series and to see how many interesting and important topics have been covered already as it's kicking off in its first, uh, first year of holding such events. I wanted to thank David Kelly, the uh, Digital Humanities Manager in the Moore Institute for hosting things behind the scenes and looking after us as ever. The event tonight was due to be held in fact in April and it was an early casualty uh, of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and it was very much in collaboration with Galway Traveler Movement. Um, delighted that they have joined us this evening and we're gonna have some words of welcome from Joanna Corcoran um, on behalf of Galway Traveler Movement. So Joanna, over to you. Thanks very much, Daniel. Uh, yeah, just uh, welcome everyone. Thank um, GTM would just like to say we're delighted to be working with the Moore Institute, um, NUIG, John Walsh and Owen de Bardoon at this occasion. We've enjoyed working with Owen on many occasions celebrating all aspects of the traveller culture. Most recently our Michelin Festival, so our Festival of Nomadism, um, which was online due, due to circumstances where Owen launched his book, The Why the Moon Travels, um, celebrating other parts of travel culture. GTM is uh, really happy to be involved in this um, conversation that's going to be started today because we believe high value needs to be placed on the traveller language, we know, which is more, not known more widely as cant, shelter or gammon. And we believe that the language needs to be recognised, validated, resourced, protected for travellers and the broader society. So, so if we, we believe that this conversation that's starting today and this webinar and hopefully the, the knowledge people gain from today will benefit our future generations to ensure the continuation of the, and the growth of our language. We thank the Moore Institute um, in the UIG. We thank Owen and John for this opportunity to celebrate and highlight our language and by starting this conversation. So thanks very much because we all know that the that minority language needs to be protected and we think this is a great start to it and it's not a start because we, this has been going for a while now but we believe this evening will be brilliant and very very informative well, thanks very much thank you very much indeed uh, thank you very much uh, joanna and uh, thank you dan as well and good evening from me i'm i'm john walsh i'm the co-director of cam the Centre for Applied Linguistics and Multilingualism, and my co-director, Laura McLaughlin, is here as well, and she'll be dealing with your questions later on. So I'm delighted to um, introduce uh, Owen de Bardoon, and um, Owen is a traveller activist who's from Galway. He was born near Toome and educated in St. Charlotte's College and also here at NUI Galway, and he now lives and works in Clondalkin in Dublin. And last year, as Joanna said, he published his first book, a collection of traveller stories called Why the Moon Travels, which is beautifully illustrated by Leanne McDonough and published by Skeen Press. So Owen, um, Galun Muni Nijes, you're very welcome matu, this evening. Matu, matu, matu. Thank you very much, John, and thank you very much, um, Joanna and Daniel and, and Laura and everybody else for drawing this together. I know it's only still unusual times, so the opportunity to extend a much needed conversation, I think that now is a wonderful opportunity. Great, and the format that we've decided on this evening um, is a, a relaxed kind of informal approach. And I'm going to basically interview uh, Owen. Um, uh, and uh, it's more like the podcast style of interview where it's more relaxed even than a radio studio. So I'm gonna start Owen by asking you to give us um, a, a sense of uh, an overview of what is meant by gammon cant. And like even the name, sometimes it's called gammon, sometimes it's cant, sometimes shelter. So perhaps you can talk, talk us a little bit, talk to us a little bit about that. I can indeed. I think the first thing to start off with is that there are so many opinions and theories that it's very difficult to, to reduce them. But there are certain trends within the community of our understanding. The terms gammon and cant are often interchangeable. Although there does seem to be some sort of, um, I suppose, geographical dependency of where it is used most often. Um, gammon seems to be used mostly in kind of rural areas, especially those which are closer to the great out areas, and cant or decant or decant in more urbanized areas, especially around um, Dublin. And the title shelter, although sometimes we do present with it, 
and it's usually in reference to, to the academia of the wider world. And it's, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, it was first coined by Charles Ray Leyland in the 1880s, 1880s as his understanding of the title, but it wouldn't be something that would be organically found among our people. But it was just most certainly it does pop up all the time because a lot of the research that's been done isn't accessible to us um, in any great way. So um, people like to put that reference there in case people have the opportunity to explore deeper. And you mentioned Gannon closer to the Gaeltacht, so that immediately raises the mm -hmm. question, what's the connection with Irish? Um, I, I think that actually the connection with Irish is, is quite strong, not only in the, the variation of the words like, like kind of Lacking and kind of quite awful, all these kind of words filtered, but also in the kind of social setting. Um, for many generations and very recently, Travers were, um, I suppose, void from the education structures and systems. So the reliability in the structure of Irish can work maintained for a much longer period of time. And our generation was like most of our great grandparents would have been very fluent Irish speakers. And that would have had a great impact on um, the language and the suitability and I suppose the, the, the vibrancy of it. And, um, and because people weren't forced into situations where Irish was removed from them and to a larger degree, um, unlike the travel meeting, which I suppose in most recent times that we didn't actually go to Irish lessons, um, but that's a different setting. But overall, the historical context would be that a lot of people from the wider community was forced into a very kind of, um, I suppose, um, English structured uh, that damaged the language to a great degree. And I, and one of one of the many blessings that our travellers had is that they were, although they were removed from some supports, they they weren't uh, the language wasn't ravaged to that degree. And um, to what extent then is gammon what we might call a full language or is it restricted in some ways? There is a perception perhaps that it's limited to a few hundred nouns, essentially. Mm -hmm. Is that true or is it broader um, than that? To what extent is it, is it expansive? Um, I think it's far more expensive than people realise because once you start looking at it, it, more and more comes out. But one of, the, one of the main things that actually shows that we have restrictions is that um, there's sensitivities around it and often seen as a closure internal language. So when people are doing research, because we've never been before the opportunity to do a collection on our own, to reach out and gather our own kind of peer researches, our own uh, collections of words and statements and proverbs and sayings, is that that giving and that expression has always been restricted. Because even like, I'm even thinking of the works of um, William Cawley, who did wonderful work called uh, Canty Macaulay. Um, afterwards, there was a, a distinct pushback from the community around the sensitivities of not only is this a language, it has evolved into a tool of protection. So when it comes to the expression of that, people that can be very, I suppose, they can be very um, hesitant around sharing it. They often share already established sources that they can access it. They, even when we're writing or publishing stuff, we often publish stuff that has already been published or changed what we mean to fit in with that because of those sensitivities. But we but overall, we've never actually had the opportunity to do a thorough um, review and investigation, exploration, and indeed celebration of the language to find out how accurate that is. But I do know when I run the, um, the workshops, and which always seems to generate workshops for people of different age groups and kind of areas, that people have this understanding that they don't know much and it's very limited. But once you actually start going, you realize there's a whole bouquet of like of beauty there just waiting to be re embraced. It's just that sometimes, in fact, that many people, especially young people, don't know what they are saying. It's actually gammon. They think it's, um, it's regular English. But once you actually start drawing them out, you realize that people have far more. Now, there are most certainly things that have, we have missed. Um, new developments can often be restricted because there's an over-reliance on the traditional terminologies. Um, but that is, that's changing. Like we have ever-evolving words like mobile phone, like with toga. So there's new words being evol evolving. And um, what people do because sensitivities have, in many areas, have a hardcore uh, reliance on what's traditional tradition. Because when you're under attack of assimilation, people want to hold on to what they feel is truthful. Um, rather than the idea of that this is an organic, ever-changing process. But yeah, I do think it's far more vibrant than we were led to believe, but the only way to verify that is actually we actually did the peer review kind of resources that we've never had the opportunity to do so. Yeah, you've covered so much there. We'll come back to various <laughs> issues there that you've we'll come, do, back to them. Do, we'll come back to them bit by bit. But you mentioned as a means of protection at one stage mm -hmm. in what you just said there. So can can you explain how that works? Is it almost like some sort of a secret code that travellers can use in public without fear of being understood, for instance? Is that what you mean by that? No, well, it's varied. For instance, like at home, travellers would often speak primarily um, in our own language. And that may often shift with people from the wider communities around because it sometimes is interpreted as being quite rude to speak a language people don't um, speak in front of them. And something that has actually, that has adjusted people's researches uh, kind of in question over time. Um, but no, out and about when people are, especially you feel that you're socially isolated, you don't have and there's the levels of discrimination, the levels of concerns, that people will, will shift to the language in, in a deliberate setting rather than an organic one 
as a way of communicating. But that is changing now because our means of communication is actually obviously growing with increases amounts of, of literacy levels and the kind of social media, kind of telephones. So there are other ways for us to continue our conversations. And I, and I, I don't really like the idea of being a secret language and because there's certainly a lot of resources out there, there's certainly a lot of dictionaries, um, but, it's, but it is a protected one. And, um, and I think there are many people, especially within the, like the governmental structures and kind of in, in certain areas of high population of travelers, like a lot of people would know a lot of the language and not realize it. But when we are in difficult situations, there is a reliance, like most people, to, to use the familiar that might exclude people that you might be wary of. And I think that is, um, that has been a developed coping mechanism for many people, but it has led to the belief um, that it's a secret language only rather than something that we actually use. Because I, I I'm fascinated by that, the idea of only ever speaking to around settled people, which means our language is about settled people rather than it's actually our language. You know, it's like kind of claiming of it, like on this thing that we have is actually about you rather than no, no, actually it, shock and awe, it might actually be, be about us. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. And what, uh, what's your own connection with the language, Owen? Growing up in Chum, was it spoken mm -hmm. by your family? Was it spoken by your neighbours? What was your own uh, socialisation in it when you were growing up? Yeah, so I, I grew up on the interior, which is the edge of Chum. Um, it's a housing estate of, of 38 houses, are we call Kenyans. And, um, and all of the people who are living in, in these homes are travellers. So it, was, it, it, it would be, in fact, in modern times, an unofficial halting site, um, although it would not be declared as one. Um, yeah, and the language is, because Chum has the highest population of, of travellers in the country per capita, is that it's very ingrained and vibrant part of it. Like most people, like, kind of like, um, like sham and lakes and kind of bigger and fiend, other, other words we know of, but also within some songs and sayings, and especially people like the saw doctors have used it over the years. And it's very much a vibrant part. But once you start searching, um, there are some very kind of fluid, fluid and fluent um, kind of speakers there. But we are in a situation, fortunately, that life expectancy of a traveler, especially traveler men, is 61. So there's a very, um, there's, we are in danger at times of lo losing um, our elder speakers. Um, and we are, thankfully, especially in my own situation, Chum, having people in their 80s um, has been such a blessing being able to connect those words um, for other people who've lost them, especially things like uh, numeracy. Like many travellers, including my own mother, would have been um, people who worked the markets. And one of the gaps they often see, especially in the younger generation, is that most people have lost the ability to count the language. And I find that absolutely fascinating um, from a community that uh, are known to be traders. Um, so there are gaps there, but again, different areas, different, um, I suppose, dependency on the language, different ways of using it. But um, yeah, I'm absolutely blessed to be born where I am and be born to a family that encouraged the use of it because it was, it was not only because it's something that's beautiful, it's an act of absolute resilience um, to the world that says that you, you are lacking of worth. And it's absolute rebellion to the idea that you kind of your voice, if you take away someone's voice, you take away a lot of their identity. So the idea of going, like speak, speak your own voice, keep your own words, because um, if anything, they'll help you hold on to yourself. Full, uh, a testimony to, to, to that issue indeed, Owen. I think what we'll do now is we'll have a quick look at some kids uh, mm -hmm. speaking gammon. It's a fantastic video that Owen has shared with us. So I'm going to uh, turn off my own microphone briefly. Maybe you could do the same, uh, Owen, and mm -hmm. we're going to share uh, this video now. Apologies, just uh, need to open it and open it first of all. Just disappeared from my screen. So just give us a moment. Okay. So. So we're going to tell you, uh, we're doing a little project today about our language. Um, so I tell you, what's the name of our language? Gammy. Gammon. So say like for instance, I, I tell, what's your name, Zanu? Come on. Marcus. My name is John. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks very much for doing this. Um, so say if I said to you, Margaret, what's a boy in our language, what would you say? Sublic. Sublic. And say if I said to you, Johnny, what's a girl in our language? That'd be lacking. That'd be lacking. What about for a man, Jack? Um, Fiend. Fiend. And say if I say woman, Bill. Yeah. A bure. Yeah. Margaret, say if I said to you, a priest. Kunik. A kunik, yeah. Johnny, what about say for country people? What do we usually say for country people? Um, like settled people or like country people. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Jack, say if we said clothes, what would you say? Tokes. And what about for shoes, Bill? 
Gillimerg. Gillimerg, is it? What about eyes, Kate? Anyone else know what eyes is? Um, what about Jack? Jack. Yeah. Jack and Jack. Anyone know what eyes yeah, is? Ogres. Ogres, thanks, Shannon. Mm -hmm. And what about for hair, Margaret? Say if we said hair. Nook. Nook, yeah, for hair. And say if we said house, Shannon. <laughs> what would you say for house, Shannon? Um, Keen. Keen. Jack, say if we said like a cup of tea or something. What would Weed. you say? Weed. And what would you say for food, Bill? Peck. A bit of peck. What about for bread, Kim? What would you say for a bit of bread? Um, a bit of? Dora. Yeah, Dora. And what about money, Johnny? Uh, crap or bread. Crap or bread. Jack, what would we say for horse? Uh, cura. Cura. And Bill, what have we said for dog? Comrade. Comrade. What about a car, Kate? Um, Ro Rogan. Rogan. Now, say if we said a word, say if I said this to you all, what would embarrassment mean? Um, take it, take it, so, take it, 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 so listen to me, that's it, and I just want to say thanks very, very much to you for getting involved in this, thank you, and thank you. thumbs up, cheers. Uh, Isn't Kitty and the kid okay. brilliant? Yes, they're, f yeah. it's, it's fantastic, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely fantastic, so, um, do you know the kids? Uh, uh, no, I know, I know Kitty from the um, um, Southside Trav Rackets group and Michael Fortune, who is best to, to work in a very small part with on that uh, recording. And what I really like about it is that um, there, there are variations in it that are not seem to be wrong. Um, for instance, things like we'd say Lork as a roga for car, because um, the roga is more of a cart, but people have obviously used it differently. Um, I, I think that you, you can see the hesitation there one stage around country people. So we have two words that we use for country people. We use either buffer or monkery. And monkery kind of died off back in the, the um, around the 60s when people were, were kind of hearing it as kind of mockery. So people realized that wasn't a very kind of um, good word to engage with people with. Um, but buffer is still something that's, that's still very, very much in use. But there are some areas, especially around Dublin and Waterford, that it seems to kind of adjust slightly to kind of be kind of word of negativity. So people are kind of a little bit hesitant to use. But I'm absolutely fascinated of how travelers call the Stephanie Beauty country people. Like people of the country, it's almost as if we're not, you know. Um, you know, especially being a primary A, people of like Atlantis, which is Ireland, but also people who would have been quite uh, the urban kind of settings. But um, yeah, I actually absolutely, absolutely, I absolutely adore that um, little video. It's brilliant. So you, one of the big issues you mentioned already on was the sensitivities over the use of gammon and the fact mm -hmm. that maybe it's deemed to be rude to speak it in front of settled people. So obviously, this must have created big challenges for research. Uh, over the years in terms of researchers, for instance, who are not from the travel traveller community, mm -hmm. uh, trying to do research on the language. Oh, it has. And I know recently, I don't want to kind of name the person because, you know, because their work is quite good work. Um, but there was somebody who did a quite an extensive research on, on our language, especially at the time, it started around 2011, before the travel tra training centres, because a lot of the travellers were employed within and closed down. And the person was in a role, one of authority, being a teacher there, but also quite identified as some of the wider community and had misinterpreted through the research is that travelers weren't using the language, not quite getting the sensitivity of it could be considered really rude, especially in the position where you're seen as an authority figure um, for us to talk this. And however, that was developed into the, they don't use it, they don't use it, rather than, like my mother would say, you can tell the proficiency of someone speaking the language when they're in an argument. <laughs> yeah. All the words come out, yeah? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, um, and then there's, so the, the settings and that social aspect and the history of community with the wider community does have a great impact of how we use it and when we use it and why we use it. So, um, but again, there's always a, there's concern of us making the language about the wider community rather than it's ours. So do you think would it be possible for somebody from the settled community to research Gammon? Oh, 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 oh Dorothy, I mean, it, it has happened, but it's also it's, it's what degree are they going to get access? You know, and one of the things you've asked here in the past is like most things when it comes to kind of in the minority group, especially with travellers, um, is that I think going peer led research often benefits far more because people get the subtleties, get the cultural nuances, get the access, and have the networks in place. The most because many people will simply just not want to speak to an academic as in anything, you know. And as a community, we are so well researched. I mean, I kind of I, I at one stage counted almost over like 20 PhDs and different topics of ourselves. Even so much so, language came up in the research regarding our DNA, in which we, it was discovered that the, um, our DNA is almost, that the analogy was that our DNA is kind of structure is closer to people in Spain than it would be to people of kind of in general Irish population. So that had been some sort of deviation over one stage. 
Um, but at the same time, is within that research, they did have some sections that said that some people of a certain family line um, would have spoke gammon more than Kent. And when I, in my research, however, I went through it, and that was based on one source um, field of this is what gammon is, this is what Kent is. So I was quite surprised of how that came true in such a robust DNA study. And so I think the, file, the, the hunger is there, the want is there, the nuance and the understanding of the research that's been done and the one that's continued to be done is lacking many times, which can lead to a very confusing overall image. And you mentioned different levels of proficiency, and if somebody's mm -hmm. really proficient, if they can argue in, in gammon or in Kant, I mean, there must be a lot of variation in levels of proficiency in the community, given the, you know, that there might be different concentrations of mm -hmm. travellers in certain geographical areas, or even some families may not be very loyal to the language for, for, compared to others, perhaps. Yeah, and I, I think very much like Irish, there's definitely, I know that we're like, a, like we're traditionally nomadic people, um, like, the, like when my people would have travelled not the entirety of Ireland, we would have had more of a conic cycle, you know, so we would have highly influenced the language structures. So there are variations in the language that do link in more with the regional Irish language as well, which is very natural, it's something we can expect, and, and that can lead to a lot of kind of um, curious understandings, as well as actually how we use some of the words, and one of the words in the recording was weed, which we use for tea, and obviously weed in modern society is a very different interpretation to many people, and it's led, it has led to events, however, it's like uh, many years ago, there was an accident beside my home, um, in Galway, and my mother came out and offered a few people, including the local Gardaí, did they want a cup of weed? <laughs> Not really knowing, you know, and most people said yes, <laughs> including the Gardaí. <laughs> right? So she was never quite sure, did he know, the, like, did he know the weed, like, or was he simply just checking her out, you know? But, um, yeah, and I think those kind of um, the intersections of kind of, of understanding can be really delightful, but also can kind of show the kind of, the, the, the languages, yeah, it's very much a vibrant, but I would say regional, regional variations, um, I suppose intergenerational exchanges, especially with kind of um, maturity rates um, and, and people's, I suppose, literacy engagement. Because it's sometimes a lot of that reminders come from either people reading it and going through it and verifying with kind of elders. But there is a shift away from the absolutes now. Um, many years ago, people were saying yes or no. And now there's more acceptance of that's something that's different. And I think that's incredibly healthy because it's the absolute of that's wrong and this is the right way and did a lot of damage. It, it made the language far more limited than it needs to be because it, it was based on one or two people who were very fluent rather than realizing a lot of the community carry different aspects of something that over time has become more splintered, but it's all very much ready to be re recoiled and rejoined together if we had the resources and the, and the time and the, I suppose the, 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 I suppose the support of the peers. And I suppose that's a common dynamic in minority language communities because mm -hmm. of the sense of endangerment um, yeah. but uh, an interesting shift. And um, you mentioned writing gammon there. So this brings me inevitably to questions around standardization. And obviously standardization is a double-edged sword. It can be enormously controversial, uh, deciding the way to write the language. If there are so many variations, is it a question of deciding the ways to write the language? How can you have a sensitive um, and appropriate form of standardization? Uh, because obviously, if you're going to teach the language or embed the language more in education, for instance, you need to have some sort of uh, move towards standardization. And I'd agree, and I'd especially a very strong advocate towards it, that it should be taught, and it should be written, and it should be recorded. Um, but the only way you can start that is actually by starting it. Um, those considerations and concerns are very organic and they're going to happen, but the only way you can actually challenge them is not in the abstract, but it's actually in the reality of the practical approach of it. And um, yeah, and I do think that there is a reliance on a lot of the older um, recordings and how the, the words were recorded. Um, and that does become somewhat problematic, but giving us and allowing us the, the space and opportunity to, to figure that out, I think would be not only empowering, but could lead to a lot more vibrancy in the language. Um, especially when it comes to this, like, the, the development of, of, of nouns and the, how, how we kind of we can structure them in different ways, different areas. And um, yeah, but I, I would say, I would say like a challenge but a challenge that most people would very warmly greet and is led to the celebration and protection and promotion of the language itself. How do you think would it be done? I mean, how would you start a process of standardization for Gammon? Um, I, I'd have a preference towards the phonetics. Okay. Um, looking at the phonetics, because again, I know most languages obviously are going to be primarily um, in, its, in the structure itself going to be oral anyways. Um, but a lot of the script work has no reliance on the English structures and some lexiconic approach. And I think for, especially if you consider some of the literacy difficulties, some of the gates of the older communities, start, I suppose starting with a kind of a more kind of a softer phonetic approach 
um, could have, it was going to have challenges either way. But I do think it's one that more people are going to resonate with, um, with their understanding, especially around accents. They are, they are, there seems to be distinct um, travel accents in certain areas. Um, like, for instance, my accent is very much a Tune Traver accent. You know, most people don't pick up on it. Um, most people expect more kind of gruntal tone, kind of, with some people from the Midlands. Um, but yeah, I think that, that I, I'd have a preference, but I don't think I should be the one making that decision. I think that should be something the community should be asked and encouraged to find its own understanding of. And what about... Although, the, of course, I'd be biased. I'd be biased, of course. Yeah, I'd be totally biased, but um, like us all. <laughs> we need to ask people. <laughs> Very good. And what about then the, um, the extent to which it's used in different cultural activities? I mean, there are songs, sayings and stories. Is, mm -hmm. this, is this cultural repertoire an important place for... For, for gammon today? Oh, I think so. And, and even within the, like what most people think of travellers now is they think of issues. And it's very interesting to understand that the very first traveller organisation that was formed by travellers was a group called Minkar Mishri, which is the traveller movement, which is the original title of the traveller movement. And so you can see at core of how important that language was, when even when people were gathering themselves up, they did it via the, the mechanism and, and the tools of our language. And um, yeah, no, and, and I, I, I think that, the understanding of, of the of the suffering is most people have never heard it sang, and um, most people have never heard any of the poems or the proverbs and how they translate. And some of them are incredibly witty. I think I spoke before how my favourite one is, um, which is which is this wonderful style of self insult that comes up all the time. And an example would have been, "May your child be born with your face," which is a wonderful to say. And if you get upset, you just call yourself ugly. And um, so there's, there's this kind of and they are quite new kind of I think quite unusual ways to to approach insults. But it's but those kind of creative aspects are very much alive of some part of the language and that kind of kind of witticism. Um, yeah, and I do think that the promotion of them and the and the creation of new ones are very much important as well. That we shouldn't be looking at the culture as only as retrospective, but one that's contemporary and living in the moment. It has, How many, it has life to continue to live. And what resources are being brought to brought forward for the development of gammon in the years ahead, Owen? Um, uh, very little at the moment, um, to be very honest with you. I know that there, there, is, there, is, there, there is the work of like, the institutes coming together, they're pooling the resources around what they actually have, like national libraries and museums, you know, like different aspects groups are coming together, national organizations, local organizations. But at the moment, language, although it's incredibly important, it's seen as such a point of resilience, there is such a pandemic around suicide ideation and a completion in the community, like one in 11 travelers passed by suicide. Um, like within just say once you are in Galway, um, like 20% of people in Galway, although it's been 1% of the population, are from the travel community. Um, life especially this one. So the understanding and need for resource on the language is always being pushed down to be quite low, although people recognize it's been so important, but people are struggling to see it with the immediate needs. And um, you know, there, are, there are a few activists who are drawing together as much as you can, their resources, uh, but not everything is very accessible. And especially a lot of the older recordings, and they might be within like private hand, hands now, or institutes who may not be very open. And um, and like discovering those and exploring those takes a lot of time and resources. And unfortunately, people don't have them as much as they, we want them to so have be available. But they are things like the um, the territory group, which is the, you know, the good speakers of the Tom Terry, um, I suppose it's review title, um, where we just bring people together quite regularly. Uh, just to share the language, like share the songs and promote and trying to work out a way in which we can explore it. Obviously, that has been hindered greatly by, um, um, by COVID, but the want and need and ability is still very much there. And finally then, Owen, because we've almost done the half an hour now, uh, what are your hopes? Um, when we were discussing this in advance, you, you said that I could ask you about the hopes for the continued resurgence of Gammon. Mm -hmm. It's a very, po very positive question. So obviously you yeah. have hope already. You believe that a resurgence is happening. So what pathway can this take in the future, given the right supports? Um, well, I think that um, two years ago in, in June, when the UNESCO announced the language as being, as being a protected one, was a very large shift within the mind sphere, which means that Ireland also agreed that this is a language that needs to be protected. And obviously there's a history of our, our ethnic recognition being quite late, compared to like 20 years later than England. Um, but it also offers the opportunity going, we recognize our language as an Irish language. It is an Irish language. And just like the Irish language, it needs to be resourced appropriately. It needs to have those structures put behind it. It needs to have that space and those kind of, I suppose, pathways for people to, to reclaim, especially the disconnected or develop what they already have. And I do think that's something that, that, that we all have a part of being responsible for, not just community in isolation, but the structures in which we all exist in. And it's not an ask. It's off kind of a, like a gagging, something that we just simply want. 
like our language is a part of Irish heritage and heritage and the beauty of who we know we are all belong to each other. And to allow something to filter away and be forgotten because of associations with over time, I suppose, with a certain community is a travesty. Because at the end of the day, we know that one way or the other, we most certainly belong to each other. And our language has certainly shown the ability to survive even under the most horrendous of situations. Owen, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. We could, we, could, we, we could talk all night, but what I'm going to do now is invite questions from our audience because we always aim with these panels to finish at, uh, at seven. So my colleague, Laura McLaughlin, is going to come in now and uh, deal with uh, questions that are coming in. So just to, to, to invite anybody with a question to use the Q&A function if you want to write the question. And if you don't want to write the question, please just uh, put up your hand and we'll come to you. So. Uh, Laura, over to you. Laura, of course, I'll Thank help you, you as much. well. If, there's, if loads of questions are coming in, I'll come in and <laughs> help, help line them up for you. Okay. Thank you. We have a couple on that. Thank you very much. It was really a um, fascinating um, uh, interview. Um, I loved a bit about the insults. <laughs> very colourful and creative. <laughs> Uh, so we have um, a couple of questions that just came in, and one from uh, a primary teacher. Uh, there is no name, so I'm not sure if it's uh, uh, he or she, so I'll uh, talk in the plural. Um, they wanted to learn a few words of Gammon and Kant to uh, connect with the travellers in the class and show appreciation of uh, travellers' culture. Um, so they got some words from Wikipedia, like Soblik and Lakin, mm. um, but they wanted to show the connections through the Irish language. Then some children, however, were happy to share uh, and help, whereas others were opposed. And so uh, this as a threat, like you mentioned. So what do you believe, do you believe, um, what do you believe is the best way for country people and primary teachers to approach this? Um, I think the best way is open dialogue with everybody, including the families, um, because their sensitivity is there. And rather than us try to work around them, we might as well just embrace them and say, this is something we want to do. And it's, it's coming from a place of wanting to empower people to recognize their heritage and their belonging, and not as a way to segregate people or to mold them. And there are resources there. For instance, there's that uh, Kant is Cool and um, Can Kant, which are both published by, and one has been republished by the um, Kids Own Publishing. And can Kant is. There's also the wonderful work of Kant and Macaulay, uh, which shows many of the Irish and, and English kind of versions of the words, which people can use to quite connectively. Um, and you also have the Navin Project's work of the, um, the, the Gammon Kant alphabet, which was a project where they encouraged young children to go off with cameras and they were assigned the letter of the alphabet and to find an object or person or, or a situation that they'd know in um, the language as a tool. And they're often used as uh, mechanisms. So I think that those hesitations are very real, and especially in families who, who've been through, a, I suppose, more intense struggle more in more recent times than others. But the best way is, to, is to, to greet it openly. And rather than kind of go around it in the background, meet people where they are and start that conversation. Because you'd be surprised most people will be very open to the understanding that the teachers wanting to engage, not to, to learn it somehow, because the resources are there, you know, um, but actually to, to encourage its use and celebration within, not only within uh, travel children, but the awareness of it within the wider community, because it's something that most people may have a sense of, but most people are very unaware of how complex it can be at times and how very much enriched it is um, within general Irish society. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a kind I of hope I've answered the question rather than rant it on. <laughs> no, but it's, it's the usual uh, kind of a uh, resistance against something that is other, you know, so that's, yeah. that's uh, uh, not unusual, yes. Um, there is another question, actually. Uh, is there any peer-led research on Gammon uh, in the works? Um, it's something that we're actually working on right now, um, but, again, but getting that resources, especially in the current circumstances, is very difficult. Um, but we do know over the, the last few years, for instance, like the Heritage Council and you know, different resources. I do believe it was like three years ago, um, the, the Department of Heritage gave something like 720,000 towards support of a video about boxing. And that was supposed to express traveler culture. And, uh, and I'm always, while there's a lot of bo boxers with our travelers, there is a growing hesitation within, within the community of its interpretation of seen as a transference of violence rather than a, as in a skill. You know, but if, if our resources in the departments 
and structures can give that amount of money towards promotion of the travel culture that and the video itself was kind of enjoyable was mostly settled people acting as traffic you know um, and like resorts and directed by and all the kind of stuff um, that the community itself wants to be able to use that in a way that will actually benefit it directly rather than the promotion of a deal around it. So they are people that are coming together. It is going to be a long process, especially COVID times, post-COVID times, limiting of resources. But the, there's a lot of people um, within the community who are doing quite active research and active kind of celebrations and workshops and releasing small little booklets and kind of um, podcasts and kind of recordings. And we were working on kind of um, a new generation of kind of... Um, of a, an app for people who could request audio recordings, submit audio recordings and have an online living dictionary. Um, but that's all, like most things, that's something that's in motion and would need not only a resource, but actually you push in a such, certain way that people are comfortable with the sharing of it and developing of it. And I do expect that probably will originally start off with being a kind of a closed app in which people will gain access via being known and identified but towards eventually becoming an open app. Because I do think the language needs to be I, within understanding of its sensitivities, needs to be shared and promoted in the way all other languages are. Uh, otherwise, we are at the risk of losing it. But our growing generation of people, especially the rising generation, the Minkers first, um, there's far more people who want to share it, knowing the vibrancy of it and knowing something that, while it protects us and has protected us, it's far more powerful tool if we use it in a way that celebrates us. Thank you. Um, we'll go through a couple more questions and then I see uh, to raise hands as well. Um, is Cant or Gammon primarily taught orally from adult to child or are there um, written texts and teaching texts in use? Yeah, um, mostly orally, um, primarily orally, um, mostly within the kind of the family settings um, casually. Like, I don't think my parents ever sat me down and said that today we're going to do items of clothing. Yeah, and um, it was a very organic process. It was done in such a way that I know as a child that I was very aware of my spaces and knowing when other children would understand what I'm saying to or not. So I'm not quite sure how that was communicated. But the, and while there are some resources, like there's the dictionaries of like Samson and kind of, and kind of um, I suppose, Leyland, they seem to be very kind of um, set, set specific and normative and external. But we do have some internal um, dictionaries that we have like Joyce's and McDonough's and Wars and Waters. Um, and and they're, they're not shared as in, as in high degree as they should be, um, but they're shared quite often within the community um, because people, I suppose, have their own process of it. But most of the language will be taught orally. Um, and I'd hope with growing um, literacy and growing moments and I suppose abilities to access to the internet and mobiles, that that will hopefully continue because the hunger is most certainly there. Okay. And um, an observation is that uh, um, you're the first person with this name. So do travelers use uh, uh, known with this name here? So do travelers use traditional names often these days? Um, are there any resources where we could learn more about these? <laughs> um, there are friends that are going, so names in the community is something that's very sensitive. So within the community structures, we'd have legal names, we'd have family names, and they would have personal names. And externally, kind of a legal name should be used internally. People are quite often okay with using family names, which is like my, one of my family names, like the structures. My, my, my mother's people are Texas, and um, my father, you know, grandfather's name is Texas, and my father's people are Camog, because um, they were very, very tall people, and they often had walking sticks, which is the word for Camog. They would be my verifier within the community of who my people are. And then my own individual name, which we use within the community is that like it's almost like a nickname, which is very unique to everybody. So I was quite lucky. Mine is Only Zone, because my father's name is Only. But, you know, uh, other people have more, more disastrous names um, and colorful ones. But um, yeah, and, and, and even within our own names, like I am from a family of people who have unusual names. Like my elder brother's name is Darrell. So we born in like the, the early 80s um, in kind of the West Galway, and calling your child Darrell from the tribal community was certainly a strong choice. Um, but it was a part of the idea of us having the sense of our surnames, our roots, and our forenames, our wings, and people have opportunity and choices. But there is a growing reflection, or I suppose, reflection of them. But also, many of our own names, uh, the word Martin, tradition name for Martin is Saren, and the tradition name for uh, Mary is Aaron. And so, there's different, um, no, there's, so there's, there is different ways of approaching, or even like um, I have many cousins called Gidge, her names are which is the Bridget Marie, they're called Gidges. And um, so there's different ways that the, the languages survive there. And they, and they are accessible. And I, I know that um, 
uh, who was it now, 1937, Samsung had a list of the names, but there's, some of them have changed over the years because people realized that they were known um, and other people had just naturally evolved. But um, yeah, and I do think that growing generations of people want to reclaim their identities and power to read their names. And I think that is a really, it's a really everyday tool and it's far more powerful than people realize because there's an expectation of, you need to be my generous Sweeney or this name, or you know, and rather people are going, like not all families see that they might actually want the title and the name to be through the language. And I think that is just as legitimate and important as many people who use the name as well get. And, um, you know, and I do think it is a part of that movement of people saying, rather than being defined by the external, we, we want to be able to have our own kind of, I suppose, um, choices and majority of ourselves and, and make, our own, uh, make, make our own identities. Thank you. And uh, I think we've let a couple of uh, direct questions come in. Cassie, I think you have your, um, your hand in, your hand up there. So if, uh, if you'd like to turn on your um, microphone and ask the question. Yes, yeah, so thanks so much. Um, that was a wonderful talk. And I'm sitting here now, you can't see because um, I don't have a camera, but I'm sitting here with a copy of Why the Moon Travels in my hand. Oh. And I'm so excited. <laughs> I read the first story, it was so beautiful, but I started crying and it was just too dark and wet to read another one in case. <laughs> um, but it's absolutely beautiful. And so I just have two wee questions about the book. The first one is about the process of these stories and whether they're more just thing that in the process of, of writing down these stories that you grew up with within your community, if you came into any sort of difficulties, like if somebody said, oh no, I remember that story that way. And if I remember mm -hmm. that story another way. And the second one is the, um, is the linguistic choices that you made because um, the chapter titles are, of course, you give the gammon as well. And then the, the sort of lexical choices of the gammon in there. And so I was just wondering um, if you could talk a bit more about this beautiful book and the choices you made. Oh, thank you very much, Cathy. You should be my PR agent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, so the, um, the structure around the book itself is that our storytelling, the storytelling tradition yeah, comes with three responsibilities. Um, one is that we honour where it came from, which means you always mention, which is a part of the book, is that where we got that story, so what happened around it, if we could remember it. Um, the second would be that, it, that the stories were told is almost as it is truthful, even the most fantastical story in the world, is that you make it alive because on one level, it, is, it does carry a truth and a reality to it. And the third is that you come with a very strong responsibility to share it. So um, while people are sensitive around parts of the language when it comes to the storytelling, the need to share a story is very much real because you and me always have been the last person to inherit that story. So when you slip into the, into the other, it may also be lost with you. So this need to, for it to pass on. But also there's a sense that all stories are living stories because they're a part of us and there comes our biases and our suggestions and our hesitations, our worries, and our hopes. And that's actually part of the living tradition. Um, so it's never so rather than it being the wrong story, people are very accepting of it being a, just a different story, and and that's one of the actually the methods I use often to remind people of around the language. To kind of, this is just a different way of telling a story and communicating. And as of the um, the choices I made is that the book was originally recorded. I did it actually in an audio format because I wanted to maintain the storytelling structure as much as I could. So I spoke the stories out several times, and then we I transcribed them. Um, so when I say things like kind of like uh, like Kamra and kind of Sublin and Russian degree and stuff, um, I'm actually saying it because I'm sitting down just telling the story. Um, so it comes across like a very kind of organic thing. So I'm not actually forcing it in in places it doesn't want to go. Um, it's a how I would have told the stories to myself, knowing there might have been several people listening to me. So there's certain ways like I would have like described things differently. And the stuff within the stories when Travers read will get very different impressions because there's certain lines and sentences and comments I make that unless you have the cultural nuance understanding you're going to get a very different image and um, I find that really really curious as well about how people are coming with the story and, like, and people say oh I thought it meant this and it doesn't mean that and on, it means that to you and that's just as valid um, because apart from now that you are a part of the story and you just need to pass on but there, but there are sense, there is sensitivity I should say within it that Travers might get in different ways and I think that I, I had fun with that to be honest I did have fun with that Thank you. And uh, Deirdre, you also wanted to ask a question. Would you like to ask now? Sorry, Cassie, are you finished? Or uh, are you going to ask something else? Yeah, no, just, um, I'm, I'm so excited about that. Sorry. And I'll be using um, 
one of I'll pick out one of the stories to use for a class I'm teaching. So just oh, don't worry, I'm going to read the whole book. But is there <laughs> any particular story that really has your heart that you think, oh, if someone was teaching a class, I wish they'd teach that one? Um, it's a very simple story, but okay. one of the stories that vibrates with me most at times, because mm -hmm. people have a huge and almost universal experience of, is uh, where uh, I'll tell you, uh, Bridge of Rears, uh, you know, where, where the dandelion comes from. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, because once people know our version of understanding of where dandelions come from, the stars, the moon, the star, obviously, you know, I won't read the story, but I haven't re read it. Um, but people never look at a dandelion the same. Okay. And I think that's a point of connection of saying, like a simple story can change how you look at the world and bring you closer to how people who live among you also look at the world. I think that's very powerful. So thank you very much for the for the celebration of it and for the. Oh, book. thank you. Well, thank you for the book. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Deirdre, do you want to come in now? Yes, actually, that's a legacy hand. It wasn't supposed to be up, but I'll, I'll ask the question that was in the that was in the chat. <laughs> Thanks very much. It was a fascinating talk. Um, I'm just curious as to um, how the revival is happening now. Um, you know, when other minority languages are struggling, and uh, this is coming to the fore so much. I'm just. Um, you mentioned that it was really a, a revival in the last few years, and mm -hmm. um, maybe have you some ideas as to why? Please, thank you. Um, no worries. I think that um, like traditionally, um, travellers have been dispersed across the community, across the, the, the sort of society um, spaces. And most traditional sites, most people would know, are very urban and away from spaces and other communities to connect with and their resources and variability and their platforms. And I do put a lot of it down to the growth in social media. Okay. The people are now able to make connections, not only with other, tra the other communities, but other travellers. In the past, they would have had a great struggle to make that actual living. Like, we could have rang people, we could have like communicated with them, but to have that more casual space of, I have a couple of minutes this evening, I want to do this. Is there anyone here available? Um, like that availability and that freedom, um, especially under a kind of a community that's under so much distress, um, is such a rarity that one of the few things that that soil soil has, um, has really allowed to grow is the potential spaces for our language to be shared in the ways that we want to share it. That's excellent. Yeah, it's really interesting. Thank you. No, thanks very much, Taylor. And some more questions coming in as well. Um, do all young travellers use Kant? Yeah, uh, most use them in a casual setting, the setting, and um, not all. Um, there, there, there is a part of our community um, due to internalised uh, oppression that wants to step away from our heritage, which not to be, not to be, which is, isn't it to be a surprise if you like, look at the factors that are in play around prejudice. Um, but there would be a vast majority of people who would use it, um, and especially the younger younger generation are again are as far as um, th there is a real want. The amount of times I get people asking me for resources and recordings and, and different bits and bobs, it happens weekly, and I'm not even one of the main kind of like kind of like the voice because there's a certain aspects in our culture of I'm unmarried, you know, all the kind of stuff. So like long time off performing any sort of an elder. Um, but would potentially be more easily accessible than other people. And um, yeah, but there, there, is, um, there, there, is a, there is a high portion of people who use it and it can be used in a very fractured sense. But once people recognize what it is, they want to use it more, which is my experience. Okay. And also, uh, there is another question. Um, as a set of person and an Irish speaker, uh, what can this person do to support the language? And also, are there any groups working to promote both Irish and Gammon? Yeah. So the uh, with groups, the, the main group will be uh, Tom Tarry, which is a collective group of the um, of I suppose Travers um, represented by organisations and structures across the country. And it came about in 2015 after the Irish Traver movement had an AGM, um, in which one of the proposed they would work on the language and bringing people together. So it's happened. It obviously, slowed down a little bit with COVID, but that platform was very much stabilized for a very long time for people to engage with. Um, and you know, and they, we were trying to draw on more of our Irish speakers because of that innate connection and that celebration and those kind of the, those, those points of connection. But what, what people can do uh, mostly, one of one thing that I often ask because we're, we're not, our language isn't held in, in, separate, in separateness to our overall structures that challenge the discrimination we experience. Challenge the fact that we don't have homes. They are our accommodation funds are underspent by like the last 20 years is underspent by 72 million. Um, the lack of resources around mental health because these do have impacts on the language. So if we're going to support a language, we need to support the people and who, who carry that language. 
and um, because if people are in safe conditions and are insured and, and, and are well protected and have services and access that they need and their human rights are protected, the language will be have a space to develop and flourish. Um, but I, I but, you know, but one of the ways that to save the language, we need to put a lot more effort into protecting the people. And I know that's a big ask. Um, but big actually, ask. Uh, there's also. Yeah. <laughs> there's also a request would you share links to books and songs for the language after this talk oh, what i do is i'll send them on to to, to john uh, to, share the, to share them out and there are ones that like be developed by resources by organizations and structures there's a couple of songs like i know amory um or mcdonough from go has a wonderful song which is her version of bernie riley's song and um, which which is really, really funny, but he was recorded in the 70s in a pub. Someone just turned up with a recorder and said, sing us a song in German, you know? And he did. It was really impressive, you know? And, you know, he said, not because he, could, he knew the language, but the fact he could turn it into a song and drop back. And, um, and things like Jack Delaney and the, and the works of Waters. Yeah, so there are resources there that are out there already that aren't within the community only, um, uh, I suppose, uh, platforms and spaces. There'll be more that we need to share with people. What we can okay. do is we can and we can post those links yes. with the recording of this. There will be a recording of this, and if or okay. if you give us the if you give us those links, we can post them underneath the recording because I know that some people weren't able to make it tonight. So mm -hmm. that's a big idea. Yes. And again, can you say something about uh, the tradition of storytelling in the community, and if there has been any research to capture this? Oh. Um, there's at least two PhDs in our storytelling structure. And a lot of the storytelling also links back in quite strongly with, with music. I know there's a recognition um, of, um, and I, I, I tell you, like, I know people talk about them all the time, no illin pipes, which to me sound like a three day hangover. And um, there is a whole tradition there of how travelers have uh, uh, for that tradition to, to survive because of uh, the limitations around that, um, that kind of uh, musical craft. So there's a lot of research that goes between music and storytelling, but there are these two PhDs that I'm aware of, one in the 80s and one more recently by a Noel Mann, um, I, I think she's a her through Trinity, um, that does touch on the idea of the, the, of the traditions. I do think there was, there was a really interesting study done in the 80s where they came across a song by a family that was singing it in Cork, and the song hadn't been, the title had changed, the song hadn't been identified for over 150 years, so people just thought, this has to be a fabrication. You know, someone has to be, you know, has, you know, and it turns out, you no, know, the, the, the family, the extended family just knew the song and they were creators or notions of themselves of these, all these older precious items that are, again, they're not just part of the travel tradition, but part of the overall traditions that we've inherited. And, um, and part of our storytelling is very much there. Like one of the things I'm fascinated about the wider community in the Irish context is that many people within the Irish structures remember the stories of why the wren is king of all birds and why the robin might have a red chest. And then that's where it stops. We like there's no seems to be. I always ask people, where are the rest of the stories? Where's the rest of like how, where are everything else? You know. And we remember the Ulster cycle, and we remember like Mav, and we remember kind of like O'Cullen, like, John. And these are thought, but the folk tales of people, um, and the mythology of people, that's very lacking at times within the general Irish uh, community. Right. And for travellers, that's something that we've been able to hold on to in, in great speed. Um, and I always kind of think going. Where are your stories and your versions of this? And you may not realize that one way or the other, you've lost them. Um, and to, to, like, to a great loss because they're beautiful. They remind us our place in the world and the world is, is how we like we fit in and share ourselves and how we relate to it. And um, yeah, so, so many parts of the, just like our language, our storytelling, it's not just a, a point of remembrance, but it's a challenge for people to, to, to remind themselves of there's things we all have lost and the things that we all must protect. Yeah, fascinating. Um, again, uh, one more question. Um, in your opinion, what percentage of travelers would be happy for country people to try and learn and promote a cant? Um, I, don't, I don't know. That can, that can vary differently, and it would depend on the motivations. So I think motivation would be a very important part. Would, would the motivation be an honest motivation to help other people share it? Would the motivation be out of curiosity? Where the motivation to be able to be able to suss out situations. You know, so I think it would be down to if people had a clarity on what motivationary factors are. Because just like many parts of our research, we very rarely benefit from any of it. 
And any of the resources that are gathered and gained are often held in isolation or extension from us that aren't accessible. Um, so I think when people come to learning the language, um, most people, I think one or two words is to be shared, celebrated, but to learn to any great depth, the depth, I should say, um, people would like to have clarity on why. And more, most people, if, if it's the community empowering clarity that's going to be shared among travelers, and most people would have, um, I, I would say, a positive disposition towards it. And finally, one question about gender and language. Um, are there any differences between uh, the way uh, the language is used by men and women? There actually is. I didn't realize this until a couple of years ago. Um, so there's this, there's, uh, um, so men and women at times have used different terms for the same item. Um, and it is genderized in, in itself, uh, but we would be aware of it. And I actually thought uh, many years ago, when, especially when travel women come together, because if you often see within social settings, um, there can be often be a very gender divide, like men can be one place, women another. And uh, however, though, traditionally, that's actually quite unusual. Because um, if you look at any of our older recordings and photographs and surviving kind of like those uh, drawings, men and women would have shared a lot of social space and have worked side by side. Um, and even up until 1998, when we had the uh, Market Traders Act, the majority of travel women had some sort of independent income onto themselves. So that, you know, you know which means they weren't over reliant kind of money and then only, so there's a whole complexity there. Um, but there would be a sense of, especially when it comes to household items, um, some, there, there, is a, there, is a, there is a suggestion that many of the words um, do favor a genderization, but I think that needs a lot more research in order to be proven out. And, um, and I do think sometimes there might be reliance on who would be the primary speaker in the family. And they're, and they're from two distinct lineages. Um, you know, like do, does the daughter follow the, the mother and does the son follow the son in replication of identities and kind of genderize the kind of forms. Um, so there is, there, there, like, I do think there is, there is there, it's proven to be there in my own family, to myself, but I think for us to stand over that in a robust way, um, like authentic research needs to be done. I do, but I have to say that there is a sense of gender uh, within the language, but, but something that we most certainly need to explore a bit more, and I would say it would be absolutely fascinating. That's excellent. Thank you. And there's a lot of appreciation uh, of your talk today, and uh, there is information going back and forth there on question and answer um, uh, in writing. Uh, one last thing is, that do travellers in the UK speak Kant? Yes, um, with Angaman, that we do. Uh, many of the travellers in, in, over there are from Ireland, but also there's, um, there, uh, many travellers have intermingled and intermarried and celebrated other minority groups, such as nomads, like Roma, Kyle, Roma, Calades, um, West Gypsy, um, who have their own variations and structures of the language, like some of them from like India, some of them from Wales. Um, we have the Scottish kind of tongue, um, and that they have, they have impacted in the language and local settings. Um, but yes, um, the people with, who are from Ireland originally are maybe several generations down. Because even though in, um, in America, in which many travelers pre the famine and, po and post and during the famine, um, communities that survived do speak the language too, especially in North Carolina. And there's a large collection of people who speak the language. Um, so it, it does survive and it has changed, of course, as all languages would. Um, and I, I actually I adore that because just, it, it just reminds me of how alive it is. Um, but yes, uh, people outside of Ireland would speak it. Well, thank you very much. That was really most informative and fascinating much, talk. And uh, thank you. And I'll um, pass you to uh, John again, who will then close this session. Thank you very much. And thanks for, uh, for participating tonight. So thanks, Laura, and thanks to everybody who came. We've had a great hour and it is almost seven o'clock. So we're finishing up now. And uh, thanks again to Owen de Bardoon for uh, a fascinating q and I think the format worked very well, Owen. Mm -hmm. Thanks to yeah, Joanna. I'm glad we, we worked it. We worked it. Yeah, we did. It might be a blueprint for us. Thanks to Joanna Corcoran from Galway Traveller Movement. Thanks to Dan Carey and also of the Moore Institute and also to David Kelly of the Moore Institute for their uh, support with this event. And our next CAM seminar is on Thursday, the 18th of March. At the same time, uh, Francesca Nicora from NUI Galway will talk about her research on prosody and language acquisition. So please watch out for our social media channels uh, for further information about that. So I'd like to thank you all very much again uh, for coming this evening. Thank you for your fascinating questions and your engagement. And uh, until we all meet again, uh, good day, Shif Sloan. <laughs>